Uh, yeah, so it's great to be here. Um, I'm Eric Matson. I'm a postdoc at uh, New York University. This paper is called Hume on the Sympathetic Formation of Preferences and the Virtues of Commerce. Now, Ross told me the reason that I was first is because David and Sandy used to have a tradition of um, having a Smith paper at the beginning of every summer institute. And unfortunately, at least until Asia uh, was put on the program in the 11th hour, there were no Smith papers on the program. Uh, but by association, I guess I was the closest one. But there is a reference to Smith in the paper. So um, yeah, anyways. OK, so the, uh, the paper, the project has two broad aims. Um, and so my first and the, the most important aim for this project um, is to sketch some conceptual connections uh, between Hume's social psychology, which is mostly developed um, in the second book of his treatise of human nature and his economic philosophy. Um, and the second aim, which is more implicit, is to use some of Hume's ideas to lay um, a conceptual foundation for engaging with some ideas um, in contemporary behavioral welfare economics which is um, a task that I'm taking up more directly in a project with, uh, with my friend Malta Dold. So in much of behavioral economics, I'll just say a brief word about this, um, this project that Malta and I are going to uh, undertake from this paper. So in much of behavioral economics, uh, individuals are supposed to have true preferences, um, which like preferences in much of neoclassical economics are capable of being stated as propositions, like I like oranges or I like apples. I prefer apples to oranges. Um, and the propositional nature of preferences implies that they can be subject to, um, to logical analysis on the basis of the relationships between these propositions, which means that individuals' actual choices can be judged is rational or irrational, so there's this fragmentary theory of rationality implicit in the theory of preferences. Um, and so welfare and behavioral economics is then chiefly understood as the satisfaction of a person's true preferences. Um, so an individual is better off if she acts in a way that's consistent with her true preferences. It is the preferences that she would possess, as Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein put it, possess full attention complete information, unlimited cognitive abilities, um, and self-control. Now, for Hume, on the other hand, individuals don't actually have true preferences. And what we can reasonably call preferences in Hume's account um, are actually non-propositional, which is something that's been argued, I think, compellingly in a few papers by uh, Robert Sugden. So preferences in Hume really aren't actually subject to logical analysis, and so they can't be considered rational or irrational, strictly speaking. Um, and so a person, this is actually similar to, to behavioral economics. So Hume conceives of people as experiencing preferences, not in an equilibrium mental state, but in a kind of constant state of conflict or turmoil. Um, and the final issue that's important for my um, current paper is that Hume sees preferences as constantly affected by social processes through the psychological mechanism of sympathy um, and the passion of pride. And so he has what some people might now consider to be an endogenous theory of preferences. And so for this project, both as, as an historical and also as a conceptual matter, it's interesting to think how Hume's theory of preferences connects with his vision of commercial society and with his economic philosophy, broadly speaking. Um, so he has some very bold claims about commerce. So he claims that the ages of refinement, which is synonymous with the ages of commercial society, he says this age is both the happiest and the most virtuous. I mean, he's very upfront about this. Um, and it's, it's not immediately obvious how this follows from his psychology. So given the view that preferences are these, these sort of dynamic passions that just kind of happen. Uh, they're experienced in this kind of conflicted mental state. They're formed sympathetically. Um, and to a large extent, they're impacted by the passion of pride. Um, you might expect Hume's attitude to resemble something more like Veblen, which is what I, I say a little bit in the paper. Um, and so he might see commerce to actually tend towards perpetual dissatisfaction. 
and encourage this kind of hapless race towards the top of um, an endless sort of social ladder. Um, but Hume's view is quite different, I argue, in this paper because, in part, he has a very different view of happiness or welfare. Um, so I argue that in contrast to, to some contemporary thinkers and other thinkers in the history of thought, Hume views welfare or happiness, which is a term that's coextensive with, um, with welfare, I think, in his thinking, um, it's not a matter of, of attaining social status or riches. Um, it's actually not a matter chiefly of preference satisfaction as such, um, but it lies in satisfying our desire for purposeful activity, that is in the process of pursuing one's preferences rather than in having one's preferences satisfied. Um, and so this is sort of the main point of, of the paper. So like I said, this particular project is more focused on the conceptual connections in Hume, um, but I thought it was worth noting some of these broader uh, conceptual connections at the outset. So for the rest of the talk, I'll basically just follow the outline um, of my paper and discuss Hume's theory of preferences, how I interpret his theory of preferences, um, and then I'll turn more directly to the conceptual relationship uh, between his view of preferences and his view of commercial society. Uh, so as I say in the paper, Hume doesn't actually have a, a theory of preferences as such in the sense that he doesn't use the word systematically in a way that maps over to contemporary decision theory. Um, and when he does speak of preferences, he refers sometimes to favored practices. Um, sometimes he refers to just a feeling-based comparison of ideas. But if we think about a theory of preferences in a broad sense as a theory um, of human action derived from desires and beliefs, um, it's quite clear that, that Hume has one. And we can find his theory of preferences in his account of the passions, which he sees to be the ultimate motivations, and as one scholar puts it, the fundamental explanance of human behavior. For Hume, the passions um, are a class of impressions in his theory of mind, and specifically, they're a sort of impressions of reflection. So simple impressions for Hume are caused just by feeling sort of inherent to the frame of human nature. Impressions of reflection are feelings caused by certain ideas. So if you touch a fire, you'll, your hand will hurt. If you think about touching a fire, you'll feel a sort of painful impression, um, fear or the passion of aversion. Now, in, in economics, preferences are, are typically assumed to uniquely determine choice. And so in sketching Hume's theory of preferences, um, I pay special attention to the sort of passions that he sees as directly determining choice, and it's clear that not all passions do. So the class of passions that directly determine choice are what he calls the direct passions. And direct passions include the passions of desire and aversion um, and hope and fear. And for my purposes, I think the most important of these is, is desire, which is a word that he uses synonymously um, or interchangeably with volition or will. So this is a kind of passion, um, a positive orientation, desire to obtain something to take a particular course of action. And so then the question is, how should we characterize Hume's understanding of, of desire or will? And in the paper, I talk about three things. I talk about the issue of rationality. I talk about phenomenology, or how the mind experiences desire. And then I talk about the content of desire. And I'll just briefly say something about the first two. But sort of the thrust of my paper is really about the content of preferences or desires, uh, which are terms that I also use interchangeably for Hume's purposes. So just briefly, as far as the issue of rationality is concerned, like I said in the introduction, and Robert Sugden has argued this, preferences for Hume are non-propositional, and therefore they're not, strictly speaking, subject to logical analysis. And there's really no theory of rationality latent in Hume's understanding of the passions in and of themselves. Um, and the second point, well, let me just say something else about that um, briefly. So Hume takes all of the passions, including desire, as primitive or irreducible feelings. Um, at one point, he says that they're original existences that contain not any representative quality, which render them copies of any other existence or modification of existence. So preferences on Hume's account are simply just feelings that arise from psychological associations. Um, and he makes the point that they're not subject to logical analysis 
quite clearly in um, one of the more famous passages in his work, which I'll just quote in full. He says, quote, "'Tis not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. Tis not contrary to reason for me to choose my total ruin to prevent the least uneasiness of an Indian or person wholly unknown to me. Tis as little contrary to reason to prefer even my own acknowledged lesser good to my greater, and have much more ardent affection for the former than the latter. Now, some people interpret this passage as expressing a theory of instrumental rationality. I don't actually think this is the case. Hume's not saying here that one can hold, rationally hold whatever preferences one wants. You know, you could prefer the destruction of the whole world over losing your finger. He's not actually saying that. He's saying that reason, understood as the inferential faculty that um, operates through demonstration and probable reasoning, simply doesn't apply to the passions. And this is quite clear in the last line of this passage that I quoted when he says, it's not contrary to reason for me to prefer even my own acknowledged lesser good to my greater. So he's saying it's not against reason to act in a manner that's inconsistent, um, which I think is notable. So just briefly on this second point about how the mind experiences preferences, um, let me just reiterate that the norm for Hume is that preferences are experienced in this sort of dynamic state of conflict. So ideas give rise to different ideas by association, um, and it's the strongest passion that determines our desire at the end of the day. Um, so let me go on to this third part, the issue of content, which is the most relevant, I think, for the connections that I draw um, with Hume's writings on commerce. Um, and this is something that I think is quite interesting. So in, in modern economics, preferences are taken to be subjective, which I take to mean that they bear no, or are assumed for the purposes of analysis, to bear no necessary uh, connection to things in the external world. Um, but for Hume, the content of an individual's preferences at a level that's very relevant to social analysis, the content is causally connected to an individual's physical, but more importantly, uh, her social environment. Uh, so there's a great quote. Hume says, the skin, pores, muscles, and nerves of a day laborer are different from those of a man of quality. So too are his sentiments, actions, and manners. The different stations of life influence the whole fabric, internal and external. And so we might now say that Hume has um, an endogenous theory of preferences, just in the sense that the content of an individual's preferences, which she bears to bring, uh, brings to bear on social processes are a function of those social processes themselves. Uh, now to understand the kind of embeddedness of preferences within um, kind of a social environment, we need to have a better understanding of the causal structure of the direct passions. So I mentioned that not all of the passions directly determine choice, and there's kind of a substructure of passions in Hume's account that causally influences desires, and these are called the indirect passions. Um, now, Hume's presentation of the indirect passions is kind of complex. Um, again, it's, it's in the second book of his treatise, which is kind of like the orphan book of the treatise of human nature, historically at least. It's sort of less treated than the other two. Um, but the most straightforward definition um, is that the indirect passions are produced out of this kind of fourfold framework of mental association. And Hume calls this a double relation of impressions and ideas. And so the two ideas involved in the production of an indirect passion um, are the idea of an object, that is the thing towards which the passion is directed, um, and the idea of the cause, which is the thing um, which by virtue of association with the object sparks the passion. And then the impressions involved are the feeling evoked by the perceived quality of the cause and the feeling evoked by association between cause and object. So there are two potential um, objects of the indirect passions. Uh, the self is one, and then others are another, and then there are two potential qualities, pleasant and painful. And so you have actually, if you put them on a chart, you have four principal indirect passions, pride, humility, love, and hate. And so you'll feel pride if um, a person associates something that is pleasing with himself or herself. So if I wear a shirt that I feel to be pleasing, it's uniquely connected with my idea of myself, so I'll feel a passion of pride. 
and the logic works the same for the others. If I wear a shirt that I think is ugly, um, then I'll feel the passion of humility. Now, one of the most interesting things about Hume's account of the indirect passions is that it's totally formulated in terms of efficient causes. So he's kind of agnostic about what determines, in terms of human nature, the course of the indirect passions. Um, he writes that these causes are determined by art and arise partly from industry, partly from the caprice, and partly from the good fortune of men. And so the social embeddedness of the causes of the indirect passions represents a kind of plasticity that Hume perceives in human nature. But underneath this plasticity is really important to note um, is a universal mental framework and set of psychological processes uh, by which the particular path of the indirect passions is pinned down in time and place. And so there's a very important section in the treatise where he talks about the limitations to the causes of these passions in time and place. I talk about a number of them in the paper, but the most important one for, for present purposes um, is that for a thing to cause the indirect passion, let's just say of pride, which is the example, the passion that I think is most relevant. Um, so for pride, we have to believe not only that a thing um, is pleasing and associated with ourself, we also have to believe that it's pleasing to others and that others associate it with ourselves. And so this limitation on pride that we have to believe that other people believe that this thing is pleasing for it to cause us pride points to what's essentially a social epistemology in Hume's theory of the passions. So our emotional bearing and evaluation of objects is causally dependent on our belief about what other people think about those objects. And the key to this communication, so how we come to believe that other people believe certain things about qualities of objects, the key here is sympathy, which for Hume is this psychological mechanism by which ideas and impressions are communicated within social groups. Um, so you're probably familiar with the idea of sympathy, but for Hume, um, just to sketch the process, we learn over time to associate various expressions and actions with pleasant and painful passions. And when we see what we take to be the effects of a passion in another person, we form an idea of that passion. By virtue of our human resemblance with the other person, we imagine that passion in ourselves, which gives rise to a related but weaker passion. Um, I was gonna say some more about sympathy, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll go on. Um, so let me just say something about the relationship between, so sympathy we, helps us learn form beliefs about what other people believe about objects, um, how they feel about them, which then influences the indirect passions. And just to connect with the issue of preferences, um, since we care deeply about the opinions of others, sympathy structures the experience of the indirect passions. We feel proud if we're associated with something that other people find pleasing, that we believe other people find pleasing. And the indirect passions then affect our desires. So we want to possess things that make us proud. We want to act in a way that we believe pleases other people. And now this relationship has, has important implications for lots of areas of behavior. I talk about two in the paper. Let me just say something now about consumption. Um, so as I say in the paper, consumption for Hume is as Veblen puts it, invidious, in the sense that it almost always um, has an interpersonal and a comparative dimension. And so we want things that please us, but the things that please us become desirable, as one scholar puts it, within a frame of reference that involves relationships not only between ourselves and other objects, uh, but between ourselves and other selves, whether those other selves are actually there when we're consuming a thing or uh, we just imagine them. And so our demand for most goods and our whole attitude as consumers hinges on our belief that our consumption activity is perceived in a certain way by others. So cultural conformity in consumption is a matter of avoiding shame or the passion of humility. Um, and seeking after social distinction is a matter of the, the, the passion of pride. So let me turn to the last part of the paper where I try and connect this to Hume's view of commerce. And so if you just looked at Hume's psychology, if you just read the second book of the treatise of human nature, 
you might expect Hume to come down somewhere like Veblen. So I don't know that much about Veblen, I have to say. Um, but just from kind of a brief survey of his work, he seems to view the advanced stages of society as promoting um, this kind of perpetual dissatisfaction stemming from interpersonal comparison. So the natural productivity and dynamism of commerce implies that status quo levels of consumption will tend upwards and wealth will tend upwards, which means that individuals will actually have to reach higher levels of wealth to attain social distinction. And the results, this is just a quote from a uh, theory of the leisure class, so long as the comparison is distinctly unfavorable to himself, the normal individual will live in chronic dissatisfaction with his present lot. And when he has reached what may be called the normal pecuniary standard of the community or of his class in the community, this chronic dissatisfaction will give place to a restless straining to place a wider and ever widening pecuniary interval between himself and this average standard. So you can imagine from Hume's point of view, this would seem plausible. Individuals want to be seen favorably by others. They're seen favorably by others by acquiring things that other people don't have, that other people consider to be um, pleasing. And so if you're in a dynamic world where wealth is increasing, well, you're gonna be constantly just trying to keep up with the Joneses, as it were. Um, so in some respects, I think Hume's understanding of preferences is similar to, to Veblen's, but he has a very different assessment of, of commerce. And he actually takes commercial society to be the form of social and economic organization that's most suited to human nature. Um, and as I said in the introduction, he goes as far as to claim that the ages of refinement or commerce are both the, the happiest and the most virtuous. And so how does this connect to, to his theory? Well, there's many reasons why he judges the ages of commerce to be so beneficial. But what I emphasize in this paper um, is that his view derives from the fact that he understands happiness to largely, not entirely, but largely, to consist in the process of preference satisfaction, not actually the end of having preferences satisfied. And so essentially the idea is that Hume interprets the, um, the freedom and the dynamism that commercial society brings as providing increasing opportunity and providing an array of new socially meaningful purposes for individuals to pursue. Not that they'll necessarily arrive at the end state of their desires, the desires are transitory and will continue to change with the dynamics of society. But Hume sees the pursuit to be one of the more important sources of happiness and well-being. Um, now, he briefly states his view on happiness in one of his most famous essays, which is called Of Refinement in the Arts, which was originally called Of Luxury. Um, it's worth noting that this, I mean, it's one sentence. He says, by, you know, according to most authorities, happiness consists in three things, enjoyment, action, and indolence. So it's just one sentence, but that sentence maps over very well to four other essays that he wrote on happiness, which make up a kind of dialogue on the nature of happiness. So these are the essays, the Epicurean, the Stoic, the Platonist, uh, and the Skeptic. And so we can think, if you take this sort of threefold understanding of, of happiness, if you think about it as, as pleasure, action, and indolence, pleasure or enjoyment is the satisfaction of preferences, um, action is the pursuit of preferences, and indolence um, is just simply rest, which allows you to subsequently enjoy more things and pursue more things. So indolence is just kind of instrumental. Um, so in a number of places throughout his work, he suggests that it's not pleasure per se, but the pursuit of something pleasurable or meaningful that really concerns us. Uh, so he deals with this aspect of human psychology with respect to the activities of philosophy and hunting. Um, in the end of the treatise. So he says in both cases, if you think about philosophy and hunting, we're not so much interested in the ends, we're interested in the activity itself. So philosophy for Hume is more a matter of intellectual puzzles and the philosopher, the mathematician derives a sense of satisfaction, not because the end is attained, but because the activity is, is enjoyable. Uh, the similar cases with hunting, he says, well, Hunting is a sport most of the time. Some people hunt to survive, but in advanced stages of society, 
It's, it's a game. We're, we're interested in the process. But, he says, and this is the important point, the end point of those activities, for them to be enjoyable, we have to think that they are actually useful to some respect. To sustain the pleasure, the satisfaction from the activities, the end has to have some use, some meaning. Otherwise, he says, the imagination just won't support the enjoyment of the activity. So if you're totally convinced, now I'm not sure how sound this is for, you know, for maybe philosophy. Um, if you know, you could just enjoy intellectual puzzles for the puzzle's sake. You know, you could do Sudoku, something like that, even if you know the end really isn't that significant. But I do think the general point is is sound that the meaningfulness of the end is sort of secondary. But in order for the activity to be enjoyable, we have to sense that the end is in fact serving some purpose, even if it's not the purpose that is of our chief, our chief concern. And he actually makes this point explicitly when he's dealing with commerce. He says, the desire for action, um, sorry, so this is a really famous passage where he talks about um, the desire for accumulation. This is something that Hirschman makes a big point out of in the passions and the interests, um, this idea that the ages of commerce sort of subvert our violent passions and replace them with these kind of calm interests. Hume says here, quote, if the employment you give a man be lucrative, especially if the profit be attached to a particular exertion of industry, he has gained so often in his eye that he acquires by degrees a passion for it and knows no such pleasure as that of seeing the daily increase of his fortune. But this passage comes immediately after his claim that there is no craving of the human mind more constant and insatiable than that for exercise and employment. And so one way to interpret Hume's psychology of accumulation then is that individuals desire action towards meaningful, purposeful ends. Now these purposes might be, well, this will bring me pride, this will bring me you know, social distinction. But the pleasure is in the actual purpose itself. And he sees the desire for action, an array of purposes, to be uniquely presented and gratified um, in commercial enterprise. And so the ends of enterprise, which are fortune and social status on Hume's account, um, are important for fixing the imagination and conferring meaning onto people's pursuits. But for him, again, it's largely the process that, that brings people satisfaction. Now there's also lots of support for this interpretation um, in his conjectural history uh, that spans his two essays of commerce and of refinement in the arts. Um, so let me just share one passage then I'll, then I'll stop talking and uh, take some, some feedback. But Hume says, this is perhaps the chief advantage which arises from commerce with strangers. It rouses men from their indolence and presenting the gayer and more opulent part of the nation with objects of luxury, which they never before dreamed of, raises in them a desire of a more splendid way of life than their ancestors uh, enjoyed. So that's the project as it, as it now stands, and thanks for your attention. I look forward to your feedback. Yeah. Thanks. It's, um, you, you, you keep your distance, you, you do a lovely job explicating, and you kind of keep your distance from telling us where you think you've got it right and where you've got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's because it's really easy to read this paper with Hume as an apologist for exploitation. Mm -hmm. Here's what I have in mind. First, um, he's making the argument that commerce is prefer commercial society is preferable not just to this or that particular society, but to all imaginable forms, alternative forms, all non-commercial society. Mm. Now, how the hell could you possibly sustain that argument? Bedlin does better. Bedlin says commercial society is worse than some other possible society. Mm. That's a plausible argument. But the argument that I, Hume, see that is, that is, is better than all alternatives. Mm -hmm. That's a strong statement. And so I was looking in there to see, okay, so how is commercial society defined? so that we could start to wrap our minds around whether in fact um, that is the case. And I don't see it here. So it's hard to then know what non-commercial society is. What are the features of, like, are, for example, are there any features of commercial
Yeah, yeah. The second point, which is related one. Uh, is that under this analysis, the participants in the Hunger Games, you know, the people who are cloning the gladiators thrown into the arena, mm -hmm. should be really, really happy. Because they are striving, mm -hmm. they're going to lose, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. There's something really important to stake, their lives, and the, they should be thrilled to be put into the mm -hmm. arena where they get to strive. Yeah, yeah. And, and that can't be right. Right, right. Yeah, those are great, great comments. Maybe I'll just say something about the second first. Yeah, so the Hunger Games participants are not happy. Um, Hume, I think, would say they're miserable. This is, uh, so maybe I overemphasize the point in the paper, but welfare happiness is not just about purpose and activity. It's just an important component. So he says there's, you know, there's enjoyment. So he does say that, that enjoyment, that you know, enjoying goods is an important part of happiness, just as activity is. Um, tranquility, peace, and security, these things are also important. So I didn't want, maybe I, I should back off on this or, or, or elaborate in the paper that it's not all about, it's not all about purpose. That's, that's, that's not the entire story. Um, yeah, it's not all about striving. It's, it might be necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient. And so in the Hunger Games, yeah, you could say, well, if people are really well off just by striving, we could you know, put them in this appalling you know, situation and they'd be great. So, so thank you, I'll, I'll clarify that. Yeah, as far as the, the first point, this is, a good, this is a good question. I've thought about this some. So what Hume is saying, and maybe I also need to backpedal here, I think Hume's claim is somewhat less universal. So I think he's saying, in England, the historical progression, commerce is the age that's happiest and most virtuous. And there's certain features of his analysis of commercial society that are more universal. Uh, so he sees the extension of property rights and liberty and security, these institutional features that I think are important to his idea of commercial society. And so that is more universal. Um, but it is a historically embedded claim that he's making. Um, and I, I need to articulate that a little better as well. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think he would say, and he does say things along these lines, that commercial society, as is expressed in advanced European societies, 18th century European societies, is better than, you know, he calls it savage culture, Native American culture. Um, but I'm not sure he wants to, yeah, I, I'm not sure how far that goes in terms of planning societies or, or mapping over to the other parts of the world. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yes. His epistemology commits him to not saying anything about the society being right? So I mean, if he's going to be consistent, he's just going to be it's not, it's not, There's not a lot of power looking forwards. It's more in, in terms of history and viewing history and empirical evidence. Um, that's sort of the basis for the claim. then we can ask ourselves what is peculiar about commercial society is that it allows for reconciliation of, law, of competing ends mm -hmm. through exchange relations. And I think that it, there might be an error either in the way that I'm reading it or perhaps in your argument here when, when Hume is talking about the formation of preferences or how you articulate it. Uh, you say that the, the strongest passion wins. Mm -hmm. um, is, I don't know if that's necessarily in Hume or not, but perhaps it's not. Perhaps the, the, the passions come to a consensus with one another. So it's not necessarily a zero-sum game, but that there's an internal exchange process within the way that we think about our different preferences mm -hmm. so that we can achieve a consensus. If that's something that's true about human nature, that, that our passions have this reconciling element in them, then the commercial society is reflective of human nature. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it could be one way for him to argue that it is the best of all possible societies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. As far as Hume's psychology is concerned, I don't see a lot of evidence that passions reach some kind of equilibrium or have any kind of communication. 
It's more just the strongest passions triggered in a particular circumstance will win out. Now you have to take strength kind of broadly. So there's different sorts of strength. So there's violent passions and calm passions. He makes that distinction. So a violent passion could be you know, anger or something like that. A calm passion could be greed or interest. But he says calm passions aren't necessarily weaker than violent passions. So there's a kind of complex, um, there's some complexity with his understanding of the passions, but he really does seem to think that the strongest passion, which again doesn't map over to violence and calmness or what we might think of as strength, the strongest passion will win the day. The strongest passion might be, it's normal for me in this circumstance to do this. That's stronger, the situation triggers that over my violent passion to steal from you. Um, even though the violent passion to steal, we might think of it as strong, he doesn't use strong quite in that sense. So I guess that would be. Are there ways for the passions to make side payments to one another? Again, <laughs> you could come up with all sorts of interesting formulations. Hume actually says, I think I quote this in the paper, that the soul is like a republic. And so, yeah. But as far as his psychology is concerned, it's not that. I mean, you could conceptualize a sort of um, like some trade-offs, but political relationships between the passions, which is quite interesting. But as far as the individual is actually concerned, in the moment, there's no such trade-offs happening. It's just sort of one passion after another, present moment after present moment. Yeah. Rob Garnett from TCU. Pleasure. I, I, just, I really appreciated your emphasis on happiness. Mm -hmm. And um, I look forward to your forthcoming paper on Smith. What struck me is in the, what you quoted here was the emphasis, you know, exercise and employment, activity, the hunt, uh, most directly this quote from the Stoic, that labor itself becomes the chief ingredient mm -hmm. of the felicity to which thou aspire. Seems to me we have a labor theory of happiness here mm -hmm. um, based mm -hmm. on a conception of the human being as homo faber mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. not, um, and it would be a mistake to translate that too quickly into, you know, the man of exchange. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll have to think about that some. Um, a labor theory of happiness. I think, yeah, I think there's there's something to that. Again, his theory of happiness is, is a little broader than, I, I think I maybe overstate my case a little bit. Um, you yeah, probably labor under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's not like... I mean, I suppose if you think about just artificially creating a project and telling somebody to do it, that might make them somewhat happy, more happy than, than, than they currently are. But in terms of like broad welfare, they would be better off if they understood and believed it to be sort of purposeful. And so that's, that's kind of the point that I, that's the point that I see him making about commercial societies, it's not like artificial ends. I mean, they're artificial in a sense, but the ends, they, people believe them to be purposeful, and it's the, the pursuit of, of the dream, so to speak, which they find meaningful. It's the relationship between perceiving the end to be meaningful and the act of pursuing it. So, yeah, but that's, I think his account of happiness is quite interesting and underexplored. And he's got the, these four essays that I mentioned, which um, I think are under undertreated, but there's compelling evidence that they're really, they make up a kind of dialogue about the nature of happiness. So he has this very, it's, it's underexplored and a little underdeveloped in my paper, but thank you. Uh, Tyler Garosh, ASU. Great talk. Uh, now we'll definitely read your paper. Um, yeah, no, so it's really, really mm -hmm. rich. Uh, good. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to attention in Hume's thought. I've, I've read Hume in a slightly different way, or maybe with more attention. Uh, so it's well, new, it's well known that Hume is a cosmopolitan mm -hmm. in favor of, of, of the commercial society. He's favorable towards the rise and, and spread of commerce. Um, he thinks it enhances all kinds of qualities, all kinds of virtues, honesty, probity, sociality. Uh, but you, on the other hand, he also recognizes that, at least in some circumstances, luxury consumption, for example, it can draw ruin upon a person. It can incapacitate us for business and for action. Uh, he's also worried about things like greed and avarice, and these things can really fester, at least among certain segments of the population. Um, also, I mean, as you note in the, in the paper in the part in your talk, he also appreciated fully the Stoics, and in particular, their view of what a flourishing life is, and how the Stoics recognize, in the end, the empty and the transitory nature of riches, of material wealth. 
So I just wonder if you could speak to that kind of tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good that's a good point. I think it is a tension. Um, I'm not exactly sure it's one that he feels he has to resolve or is that concerned about in the sense that all forms of society have pros and cons, if you will. People are prone to different kinds of vices under different forms of social arrangement. And so the question is, what are the implications of those vices in a social setting? And so one thing that he sees is that, yeah, avarice, he says avarice is terrible, it can ruin you, but the effects of avarice in commercial society do have, in fact, public benefits. So this is Mandeville's point, private vices, public benefits. And so the expression of vice in a social setting um, is in general more positive in commercial society for, for Hume. As far as his cosmopolitanism is concerned, there's also reason to think that Hume thinks that commercial society improves people's judgment and makes people more moral because it breaks them out of parochialism by virtue of being exposed to more people and also by virtue of the institutional changes that commerce brings. Um, and so you could think about, so it's sympathy in Hume is actually multi-dimensional, and one of the dimensions relates to structures of political authority. Um, so basically political figures are quite focal and people see them, they're obvious, so people take after them. But commercial society tends to break down the vertical structures um, and widens sympathy and exposes people to more views. And so I think Hume is, maybe he's overly enthusiastic about that, but he does, he does make that, that point. Um, so that, I guess that's, that's what I'd say. The expression of vices is different in a different institutional setting. Um, and also he sees that the dynamics of commercial society may improve people's judgment. I'm not sure if that's sound, but I think that's a sound reading of what Hume says. David. One on George's point, I think that to answer the desirability of commercial society, and especially if you want to make strong, necessary claims, the, you need to start with Hume stuff on property, which is, and that is that it's completely clear that he thinks that worlds without property are the happiest worlds because there's no scarcity. When there is sufficient affection. And so that now in economics these days, the human theory of property goes by the name of Alch and Demsitz because Harold didn't know very much. And so, so that there's a, um, that Arnold Plancher did. And, and so that that's where the, that, and so there's a strong necessary claim there is that without sufficient affection, without abundance, where it's necessary. <coughs> property. And so I think things flow from that. And so those are going to be, that's where the strong stuff is. Mm -hmm. on, 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 the, on the question, on, on the question about the sort of the, um, um, the, the striving as a necessary for happiness, I think the the, tech, the the first one I read there is Ferguson. It's absolutely clear that striving is necessary for 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 happiness. After we satisfy our difficulties, we're going to create our difficulties again, so we can strive again. And so, and then that's sort of, and then your reaction. I read him a long, long time ago, but it never really occurred to me until this moment that golly, he's the only one in that group who was fluent Gaelic. Nobody, nobody else in the Scottish group knew Gaelic. Mm -hmm. And so Ferguson was a chap on the black watch. So there's, and Ferguson has an interesting position on the Aussian debate. So there may be something something in, the, in that group where there is a position that striving is maybe the same as happiness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, and so the you know, and then scholars have done Ferguson Hume all the time. And so there's lots and lots of and I don't think Ferguson was bad about writing letters as Smith was. So there may be there, there may be correspondence and so about that. So that may be the, the place you tease that tease that out in that in that interrelation. Do you know where in Ferguson he talks about striving offhand? Oh yeah, it just it's just sort of he talks about we you know we we establish we we attain our goal 
we, we, we attain our goal, and then what's the next thing we do is we want to create new difficulties. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's, a, there's a great old leader saying the fantasy book by Eddie, is it Eddington? Was exactly the same thing. After we satisfy our goals, we got to create new things because we're going to sit around and be bored. And so that we need, and you know, Frank and I used to put that sort of thing in um, from Plutarch, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's Ross, good. Ross will have the exact text. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, one other thing that I'll say about um, the, the, the property issue, and this is clear in Hume's essay um, of refinement in the arts, which some people view as kind of like a synopsis of the third volume of his history of England. He sees that uh, commercial activity, that luxury actually ends up creating a new class in society and extending property rights. And this is one of the reasons, like in some sense, society becomes more egalitarian and it also extends property rights and security. And so that's an important institutional feature of the story. Maria. On, on, on Denise's last point, uh, there's a question either for you or Ross. How does Hume differ from that uh, idea of striving for striving sake as opposed to satisfaction? Which yeah. is satisfaction when you're achieving your goals? Mm -hmm. Another clarification on humility. Um, what is the relationship between humility and shame? I think humility is shame for Hume. So he uses the word, I think I have a footnote in the paper, he uses these words in sort of different senses than we normally take them now and also than people took them in the 18th century. I think part of this was his um, anti-Christian bent, so making a big deal about pride as a virtue and humility as a vice, whereas he calls it one of the monkish virtues in his second inquiries, so these useless monkish virtues, we don't need this. Whereas in the, the classical Christian tradition, humility of course is a virtue and pride is foremost among the vices, but for Hume, a healthy pride is essential to the virtuous life. Um, as far as the relationship between Hume and Knight, that's something I've, I've thought about. I don't know Knight that well, I have to say. Um, my answer would be that they're quite close but for Hume, the individual, it's less aspirational and more socially Im embedded. Uh, so what you want is not, there's this less of a sense of kind of aspiring in this beautiful aesthetic way to become this kind of great, you know, to, to construct oneself. It's more like the self is being constructed by people around. But there is also this sense, Hume talks about, he says your, your sense of community can also come from literature and from other philosophers. So in that sense, it can be kind of ideal. Like your sense of greatness doesn't have to come, you can sort of transcend what your community thinks is good and what you think would bring you pride among your community and say, well, I have a broader sort of spiritual idealized community. That's how I would, I would answer. I don't know how that m maps up with, with what you think, Ross, but yes. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I just, uh, this is more a clarification than anything else. So could you maybe say something about how this squares uh, this synthetic formation of preferences uh, with uh, Hume's notion of causality uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that I, think there might be some attention there. Uh, in the sense that saying that something causes something is a tension with Hume's idea that... Well, with this way of thinking of how preferences are formed. Mm -hmm. What's the tension? Uh, well, of, I mean, he's an empiricist, right? And, mm -hmm. and for him, the idea of cause was basically in our minds that we would only be, we would not be able to see causes. This was just mm -hmm. the way we... Uh, deal with constant conjunctions. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this this notion or this psychology somehow uh, seems to me, yeah, to be in in, in, in tension at least uh, with that view of causality that he had. Yeah. So that's a kind of a broad question. It's more about the relationship of Hume's entire scientific project with his views of causality in in Book One of the treatise. The way that I think about it, I think this is. Well, I think it's right because it's the way I think about it. Um, is Hume sort of lays out this, this account of causation and says, well, 
you know, at the end of the day, causation is just something in the mind that we impose on the world. We don't actually discover final causal relationships. This leads him to this dialectic of skepticism. At the end of the treatise of human nature, the, the book one, this kind of leads him to this existential crisis. He comes back from this and says, well, I have to sort of immerse myself in the common world. And yes, we don't actually understand final causation, but we still use the language of causation in our analysis. And he uses causation throughout his work in this, in this sense. So um, I think he finds this empirically supported by his observations. And I don't think he finds any trouble in, in calling this causation in some casual, efficient sense. That, that's off the cuff, what I would say, so. Yes? Uh, I'm Ted Berzer from Denison. I had the comment about greed uh, <coughs> helped me crystallize uh, the question I have. Uh, is there a sense, can, can we construct a sense of the, the limits to commercial society? Uh, and so what I'm thinking about is too much action uh, squeezes out indolence mm -hmm. and Society where it's all striving all the time, mm -hmm. and one which you know he works six hours a day and yeah yeah. The time you, you read it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, that's a good. That's a good point. So you know, Hume is writing in the 18th century. So this was before the Industrial Revolution. And so his observations are more of like an agrarian capital society. Uh, so maybe he would sort of change his tune a bit if he saw the world 100 years later um, and be less optimistic about striving as a component of welfare. Um, so I think there could be something there. You know, he does talk, as, um, as Tyler pointed out, about you know, the Stoics and the idea of cultivating social virtue. Um, and so there is, you could imagine, a sense in which commerce crowds out the formation of, of, of virtue. And so you could, you could conceive of some, um, I mean, he's very optimistic and probably over, overly enthusiastic. Uh, but again, his idea of welfare and happiness is not just in action or just in labor and purposes. He also um, writes a lot about literature and um, personal relationships and friendships, and these are important aspects as well. So uh, yeah, I, sh I think from his account, you could say, well, we could have a hyper-commercialized society. Um, but then the question is, what would be thing to do about it other than telling people that they should spend less time trying to accumulate and more time reading, you know, the Stoics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know how far you want to push the connection or the contrast with Veblen, but uh, one thing occurs to me, uh, uh, Veblen, for Veblen, the whole point of conspicuous consumption uh, was the practical pointlessness of the acquisition of commodities. So in this sense, there's a stark contrast between hmm. what Hume is saying and, and Veblen's attitude. I would also mention that Veblen was writing 150 years after Hume, and commercial society had evolved to a different place by then. So he's observing different things from mm -hmm. what Hume is. Yeah. Uh, Rob Garnett's comment made me think that in Veblen, uh, he talks a lot about the instinct of workmanship. So there's a a parallel there in you. And then the last comment I would make is on a, a slightly different issue. It was prompted by what George said, and I thought he was going to go there, in fact. And that is that when you talked about all of this stuff, he seems to have in mind only the class of human beings who are kind of like him, uh, the class of people who have some autonomy in their lives. <clears throat> Uh, and he seems to have no idea that there are massive numbers of people who don't have any mm -hmm. control over their lives. And striving for them means a different thing. It means something closer to what's going on in the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not a Yoon scholar. I don't know what he had to say about uh, real working class people for whom uh, consumption and striving meant very different things mm -hmm. from what it meant for people like you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, let me just say something quick about the last point. Um, I think it's, it's true of most authors of the time that they were thinking and writing for their own class. But I do think that Hume was, was quite egalitarian in a sense, and he was quite interested in, in the laborers. Um, in his narrative, his historical narrative of the transition out of feudalism, this, 
this comes across. Um, so Adam Smith, actually Edgemer is going to talk about this later, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, when he talks about the transition out of feudalism, says, well, these, these people, they gained liberty and security. They were no longer dependent on these capricious lords and barons. Um, and he, that's, that's straight out of Hume, and it comes across in his essay. So it, it, he's explicit. It creates a new class of people who were formerly these dependents. Now they are independents, and they actually can have, you know, lives outside of the domain of, of the lords. And this has institutional effects because, you know, these people come into the House of Commons and they demand new laws that are regular and protect property and don't depend on the whims um, of, of, of the lords. So, yeah, as far as the Veblen stuff, that's, that's great. Like I said, I don't really know Veblen very well at all. Um, I do, so uh, Veblen actually writes in a couple places quite favorably about Hume, which I think is really interesting. And as I just look through his work, I do see some parallels. So I think maybe that would be a separate project doing the comparison, but thank you for those pointers. Maybe we can think also about uh, Hume's optimism about commercial society as somewhat backward looking. Mm -hmm. I mean, because when he, it's when he observes, he tries to identify general causes of about commerce when he is most optimistic about commercial, about how commerce brought about liberty and virtues, individuals and everything. But when we look at his political essays, political essays, or I mean, most of them are political, and, and his history of England, we see how he's anxious about what's going on in England, and that's the most that's the society that's the most progressed. I mean, he's really he really thinks that it can be like Roman Empire because of all this territorial expansion, and I mean, there is it's it's the commercial society with it's it's the model of commercial society. So I think there's this. I don't know, but like it can be like backward looking and forward looking. I don't think it's forward looking. He's not. He's not that optimistic mm -hmm. about. I think that's a great point, and I think that's that's right. That he is a little bit concerned and pessimistic about things that are going on in his day in the political scene. Looking forwards, um, is a kind of broader institutional or political question. Then um, the question is, what would he have done about it in particular? Um, so it's, that's that's an interesting question. But I do agree with you that he was happy that England accidentally. It, ended up where it ended up, he was not so optimistic about its prospects politically going, going forwards. Um, that's a good point. I need to think about that some more. Yeah, so how does learning enter the picture there in the formation of preferences? So how do you update your preferences in light of the consequences of your choice? And so there should be like some feedback loops. Yeah, that's a good point. I think there's a few feedback loops here, actually. Um, there's a feedback, I think all of these actually have feedback loops, so that's a good point. I mean, there's a feedback loop between the indirect passions and sympathy, um, which is, which also relates to choice. So you do something, um, you see people react in a certain way, this either confirms uh, by sympathy, by observing what people do, uh, that your desires in fact had uh, some kind of warrant in other people's opinions or not. So. I do need to add some loops. I didn't want to make the picture too complicated, but it is a, uh, they're all sort of like <laughs> integrated. That's, uh. Yeah, but there could be many loops there. What is his opinion? His opinion, well, uh, for one, sympathy sustains pride, um, and choice actually leads back to sympathy as well, because when you do something, it elicits an emotional response from another person. And you sympathize with that emotional response, which then informs your experience of the passion of, of pride. Um, relation between this and the price species flow mechanism. Um, yeah. 
Well, it's interesting when he talks about the, the price specie flow mechanism, when he's talking about the effects of the inflow from Cadiz, it's not just the inflow of gold that changes, um, that's a change, it's also the manners of people that are a change. So in that sense, you could see this kind of operating on the surface. So it, it's kind of interesting in, in his account how he sees manners as changing economic outcomes. Um, and so in that sense, this is important. It's, it's quite important, as I pointed out, to his the psychology of, of luxury. Um, and so I think this, this is kind of his, the core of his theory of human behavior. So it sort of rides under all of, his, all of his work. He doesn't always draw explicit attention to it, but I do think it's there. Desire and preference. I see preferences as essentially comparative, whereas mm -hmm. desires are directed at single objects. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you might. Speak yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I guess maybe I, I use the term preferences a little bit loosely. Um, so your point again is that preferences are comparative, whereas desires are directed at single objects. That's generally the way that. I, I mean, I can imagine a, a theory of preference formation being based on desire, whereas I can't imagine the opposite being the case. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't have a great answer for you off the top of my head. I'll have to think about that some more. Um, but I, I guess I maybe use the term preferences a little bit too loosely in an attempt to sort of draw him into some contemporary conversations. But um, I really am just talking about like desire and will and how that affects choice. Um, which again, to go back to an earlier comment, is sort of how he understands behavior. He doesn't see that we all the time are like comparing things in our minds at the, at the moment of choice. So maybe it's just a word that is inappropriately annexed and applied to his, his thought. So thank you for that. Well, let's thank, Eric. thank you. Thank you.